So uh, yeah, like Lillian said, I'm, I'm involved in some research about the um, behavior of producers and consumers on, um, mainly on YouTube, um, which is a platform intermediary that we're all familiar with. Um, and um, with Martin Kretschmer and Danusha Mendes, uh, I was involved in 2012 before joining Create in some research about um, uh, essentially um, music video parodists. Uh, and um, their effect on music rights holders on YouTube. So I'm, I'd like to speak a little bit about that um, today. But I'd also like to um, p potentially move things a little bit forward um, from thinking about uh, the, the, the problem of, um, let's say, uh, rights holders complaining about user-generated content on these platforms um, and then the uh, effect of takedown on that, on that expression. Because I think actually some recent episodes on YouTube have shown us um, some potentially new directions for research. So I'd like to kind of um, suggest a research agenda that we might pursue um, in the coming years to better understand the dynamics on these platforms. Um, I'm really excited that there are some YouTubers here at the festival who've come for a meetup. Anyone, is a YouTuber, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Oh, well, they're maybe either shy or they've all stayed home because of Brexit to um, work on their <laughs> YouTube videos. But, um, but I'm hoping that, um, that you know, this will be a dialogue and maybe they'll, um, they'll, uh, they'll prove me wrong about, about some of the things I'm going to uh, say just now. So to start off, um, like I said, in 2012, we were invited by the Intellectual Property Office UK to conduct some research about uh, the effects, the economic effects of parody on um, rights holders. And we selected uh, YouTube as a field site for that research, um, which was conducted as part of the Hargraves Review. We all remember um, the Hargraves Review. Uh, and one reason why we chose YouTube was because there's, there, there, there's just a lot of um, parody on YouTube. When you think about parody, at least I did in 2012, that was the first thing I thought of. Um, and also, it's a really interesting uh, place from which we can gather data and, and objective data about um, essentially transactions and markets and um, um, you know quantities of production and consumption um, by cleverly sort of uh, you know um, mobilizing and using some of that data that the platforms themselves use to um, to uh, be profitable. So our methodology was like this: we sampled uh, 350 songs that were hits in the UK in the year 2011. We located them using British charts company data, um, and then we hired a bunch of research assistants. And this was still before computer-assisted, uh, you know, uh, coding had, had 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 become de jour. We hired some uh, research assistants to go and look for each of those songs on YouTube and see if there were any parodies of those songs. We found. Uh, 8,299 parodies. I suspect that if we did a similar exercise now, we'd find even more. Um, this was before um, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, hit uh, Korean um, uh, pop, pop song by Psy that um, you know, attracted a billion uh, parody views, not even the original. The original had a billion views as well, but the parodies did too. So we looked at each of these parody videos, we actually watched them, and we could try to figure out what kinds of um, content were in those parodies, and we recorded information about that, and this will become important later. The, the brief thing is that um, we crunched some numbers comparing the viewership uh, of the, um, let's say, commercially available music video, which sits on YouTube, and the aggregated parody videos, which also sit on YouTube. And we could not find any evidence that there was harm to rights holders from this parody practice. In fact, we, we argue that there was an uplift that we observed for songs that were not such big hits. You know, it seemed to help the little people a little bit more than it helped the, um, the Lady Gagas of the world um, then. So, so we, we, we suggested that to the government, and um, uh, luckily, as, as you guys know, we, we had a, a, a new fair dealing exception for parody introduced in, in 2014. Um, before the parody exception um, was introduced in the UK, we did a follow-up study on the um, parody videos. We went to see how many of them had been taken down in the year between 2012, when we first did the study, and 2013, when we revisited the sample. We found a takedown rate of 15.5%, right? So, um, you know, uh, that's interesting in itself. It shows that, you know, some of these parody videos, they, they did not pass muster in terms of what the rights holders were happy with. We were interested to know if the rights holders, who presumably were the ones taking these videos down, were, uh, were walking the walk that they had expressed in um, policy responses to Hargraves, to the Hargraves Review, where they said that they were concerned about substitution, they were concerned about losing licensing revenue stream, they were concerned about moral rights of creators. 
In the pattern that we observed in the tank down, we found that the videos that were most frequently taken down were ones with low production values, low numbers of views, uh, confusion about the type of parody that they were, and um, rock songs and pop songs were slightly more frequently taken down than uh, rap videos and or parodies of rap songs and parodies of, of, um, of uh, electronic music. So we couldn't really discern that there was a pattern of takedown that reflected, let's say, the publicly expressed um, interests of the music rights holders, and we find that, that, that interesting. Um, so that's one body of research you know, that we've, we, we've, we've done, that we've tried to understand the effect of the takedown process on, on, on creativity. And I think it's important, I think there's still a lot more work to be done in this space. But a recent episode that which has arisen has suggested maybe some new directions for, for, for research in this area, and I want to share that with you. So these two fellows are um, uh, Ra Benny and Rafi Fine. <laughs> And they go by the Fine Brothers. They have a channel on YouTube um, called the Fine Brothers. It has 14 million subscribers. And um, early this year, in January 2016, they uh, announced to YouTube through a video, this is the, actually a still from that video, that they were planning to try to protect and format uh, reaction videos. And reaction videos are something that they, they've innovated on YouTube. It's essentially you put somebody in front of a computer, they watch something, and you film their reaction. So there's children react to, older people react to, copyright lawyers react to. Um, and uh, and they, they actually applied for trademarks in those, in those terms react in relation to um, online video entertainment. And they offered a revenue share to YouTubers to join something they called React World. And so basically they were trying to license their format to other user creators to create videos on that same reaction uh, brand. And they would split the revenue generously 50-50 uh, with them. So YouTube was very unhappy about this uh, proposal by these uh, essentially user-generated user, user creators. Um, and they reacted the way we would expect YouTube to react to this sort of thing. They viciously parodied them. So this is an example of one of the parodies, um, you know, uh, which, which reacted to the, to the Fine Brothers proposal that they were going to propertize and commercialize this sort of user-generated content, and they were not happy about that. So in the discourse that emerged around um, the reaction to the React, uh, we found a lot of really interesting, I think, um, uh, uh, different, uh, let's say, features. So one is that that uh, you know we see a kind of um, uh, real opposition to uh, commercializing a practice which um, other user creators feel is in opposition to traditional commercial media. So they didn't like the idea simply that there was sort of a co-opting, if you like, of the sort of YouTube um, community. Um, secondly, you know, uh, I think if you're interested in legal consciousness, this is an interesting case study because in some ways, like in terms of the understanding of what a television format is and, and how it can be protected, there was a lot of confusion among um, commentators about, about those things. But what there was actually interestingly was a very strong understanding among YouTube creators about the uh, value of fair use or fair dealing to their particular practice. And they, they, um, they, they very quickly sort of rallied around the concept of fair use. Um, also, uh, I, I'm quite interested in the extent to which these user creators that complained about the React, re, uh, about the Fine Brothers, were themselves engaged in common spaced peer production. They saw themselves as part of an actually a, a collective whose agreed norms of sharing and um, uh, fairly using each other's content was to the benefit of all of the members of the YouTube video making community. So they saw it as a kind of a, 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 a commons um, that required um, careful governance. Um, and within that as well, we see um, you know, community norms. Another very interesting problem that arose was the direction of the, of the takedown notices was suddenly unusual, right? In the previous study that we did, we were looking at big music rights holders taking down content by uh, small user creators. Here we have user creators sort of fighting with each other over um, you know, rights. And I think that's a, just a very interesting kind of uh, development. It's new to me. It's probably not new to YouTube. But I think there's potential here to um, study those patterns. So just to close, I, I want to just um, suggest some new relationships that emerge um, that, that uh, 
uh, are highlighted by the, the, the case example that I just described that are worthy of, of maybe more scholarly attention than they've received so far. I mean, certainly one is that there has been far less study of the IP disputes between users on um, platforms like YouTube than probably those kinds of interactions deserve. And I think we should uh, try to study further um, with a variety of methods what's actually going on there. A second issue which was raised by the, the, the Fine Brothers' initial sort of um, you know, appeal to the community was they, they didn't see themselves as co-opting a um, commons. They saw themselves as fighting on behalf of the little people against a perceived threat from larger media companies. They had disputed in 2014 the use by the Ellen DeGeneres show of a very similar React-like video format, which they claim was taken from them by uh, Ellen's um, you know, media advisors who might have seen it on YouTube. So there's this, this, this um, uh, you know, feeling, I think, among some of the smaller uh, user creators that actually larger media companies are um, infringing their work and, and so they're trying to mobilize to protect that, that, that content. Finally, um, I think we also see interesting developments around the edges of these intermediaries. Um, one other area that we're interested in studying and create are um, let's play videos and fan made content. And what certain uh, you know, computer and video game publishers are doing is they're actually issuing uh, content, fan content licenses to creators directly. So they're giving them a, you know, a priori permission to make um, you know, user-generated uh, videos based on, the, on, on content that they control. So there are a range of new practices which I think are emerging on these, these intermediaries which are worthy of our attention. I think it's a really exciting space to be working in. Um, and I think that there's a lot of, 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 of work that, that we could do together. And I hope to work with some of you in this room on, um, on these new directions. So thank you very much. Um, yes, as Lillian mentioned, um, I'm from UC California, Berkeley, um, and I've been working for the past couple of years on a project with my co-authors, um, Joe Karaganis from the American Assembly and Jennifer Urban from UC Berkeley on a empirical research project studying how notice and takedown is working in, in everyday practice, um, at least in the US. Um, and so just for those of you that need a little primer on this, this is a system by which um, rights holders or their agents can send a notice to an online service provider and in return for taking down content from their platforms in response to that notice, they get a safe harbor for liability for the infringing activities of their users. Um, one of the reasons that we thought it was a good time to look at this now is because there's a lot of focus on the scale at which the system is being used right now. Um, so this graph is often used as an example of the, of the growth of the use of the notice and takedown system. Um, for the left-hand side of the graph here is about August 2011, um, uh, at which time, YouTube, uh, not YouTube, Google Search, Google Web Search was receiving about 150,000 of these requests to take down material from their index um, every week. And in the last few weeks, that's been about 20, 22 million. Um, so it's really had a dramatic growth. And in part, um, it's because of two things. So the first is the shift towards professionalization of this notice sending. So either within trade associations where there's dedicated content protection teams that their sole job is to, or one of their main jobs is to find infringing content and notify online service providers. And then the growth of a third party service, which we call rights enforcement organizations, that their sole mission is to send these notices. Um, and in conjunction with that, um, automated systems have been developed to um, search the web for these, this content and send notices. So um, this seemed like a good moment in time to understand if notice and takedown is scaled, we scaled well to, to meet this growing demand. Um, and for another little bit of anecdotal comparison purposes, my co-author Jennifer Urban did one of the last research projects, empirical research projects, looking at these notices in detail. She did that in 2006, so the system was about eight years old at the time. She studied all the notices in the Chilling Effects database, which was about 900 at that time. Our data set for six months was 108 million takedown requests. 
Um, so I'm going to, uh, this is a 160 page report, it's available for free on SSRN, so please if you want any more detail, um, I can only give you the 10 minute version, and it has three studies. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on study one, which was our qualitative portion, so we interviewed about three dozen online service providers and rights holders about how they were working with this system, and then our quantitative studies were two and three, and I'll spend a little bit more time on those today. Um, but what I do want to say about study one, which was a little surprising to us in light of the introduction I gave you about the growth of the use of the system, um, is that there's a, a huge diversity in practice on the online service providers that I think is getting lost a little bit in the policy debates that are happening right now, at least in the US, um, about the failures of the system to address infringing content because the numbers of notices that are being sent. When in fact that we found about two thirds of the online service providers that we spoke with are actually operating in what we call DMCA classic mode. So they receive relatively few notices and these are some, um, un unfortunately we promised um, anonymized reporting, but I, so I can't tell you the details of these people, but um, they are names you would recognize, big players who have a very large web presence, um, very large numbers of visitors who still deal with just a handful of notices a year. So they're outside of the major copyright debates around search and music and movies, um, but they host a lot of content. They get, you know, some of them a handful of notices, some of them dozens, some of them hundreds, but they hand review those and just do a very um, old school process in dealing with those notices. We have another category we call DMCA Auto, which is still operating in response to notices, but they process so many of these notices, they've developed some sorts of automated systems to dealing with them, but always in response to a notice. And in the very top of the triangle, there's a handful of providers who have gone above and beyond the requirements of the DMCA notice and takedown provisions um, to develop extra measures for, for dealing with potentially infringing content on their platforms, and that includes developing filtering systems like content ID on YouTube, um, and sometimes just entering into agreements with rights holders where the rights holders have direct back end access to remove material from the system without any of the due process mechanisms that we have in notice and takedown, including notifying a user that their content has been removed. Um, so the overall picture I think is uh, an important reference point is very diverse. The DMCA classic providers are quite worried about any legal or policy changes that would require them to do things such as filtering. Um, they can't afford it. They think it uh, uh, might be damaging to user rights and they just don't have the infringement on their platform that warrants it. Um, okay, that was a brief rundown of one of the main findings in study one. Um, study two is actually where we built a custom database to look at the integrity of the individual notices that were being sent to, to see if they complied with the statutory requirements, um, to see if they were actually being used to address copyright infringement or if they were trying, if, you, if um, senders were trying to use them to manage other types of rights. Um, so the first data set was a six month period in 2013. Um, about 108 million uh, takedown requests, about 300,000 notices, but each of the notices can contain lots of different requests. Um, by and large, um, Google is by far the most major contributor here. So the study two data, the main set is 99.4% Google web search. So you can consider this pretty much a, a, a study of what's going on in Google web search. Um, this didn't surprise us. I told you there's a shift to using agents to send these notices. About 92% of these requests came from agents and only about 7.5% came from the copyright owner themselves. Um, largely the music industry was the main contributor, so 44% followed by the adult entertainment industry and then movies and television third. Um, this we did think was interesting. So in our study one interviews, rights holders were um, really keen to emphasize that um, their, their targeting system, so the algorithms that they're building and the sites that they're targeting are what they, what they refer to as the worst of the worst. So they're minimizing um, uh, harm to expression by targeting torrent sites, file search sites, um, cyber lockers, aggregator sites, these sort of things. And we really did find that to be an accurate reflection of what is going on. So about two thirds of these no notices were either targeting torrent sites or file search sites. Um, 
However, nonetheless, we did still find problems of accuracies in these notices. So um, about one in 25 or 4% or of these notices targeted content that did not match um, the copyrighted work that was being complained about. So I, I have a couple of scenarios here with the main types of uh, places where this came up. Um, this is an example of where a copyright owner is using um, the search term Microsoft Office 2010, and it ends up on a search result page on a file search site. And you, you can't see from here, but trust me, nothing on here matches the word Microsoft Office 2010. Um, there's things like um, the search term, actually, if, if you could see here, the search term they used on this page was Microsoft Office Home Edition. So there's things on here. There's Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Um, there's Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Um, but there's nothing on there that is Microsoft Office. Um, so that's one where there's just a complete mismatch. Um, and another, this was very common, terms that are just very broad, terms that aren't um, likely to end up in something very specific to the rights holder. So here's another example, um, a notice sent on behalf of the R&B artist Usher, um, targeting, presumably trying to take down uh, music, uh, songs or albums by Usher, ends up with The House of Usher, a 2006 horror film. So this is the type of thing that made up that 4% that we're just calling out and out wrong, they're, they haven't matched what they're looking for at all. Um, definitely problems with algorithms going on here. Um, I won't dwell too much on this, but about a third of them we, we raised, um, we, we call questionable. There are other issues raised in the, the tagging that our coders did. Um, about 15% of them failed to comply with statutory requirements, and that was largely either failing to identify the copyrighted work or failing to lead to a place where the infringing material was at all evident. Um, and we consider that a big due process problem when the intermediary can't even analyze the claim because they don't have either side um, of, of the argument there to compare. Um, about 7% had features that potentially could be fair use under US law. The majority here are um, where a small amount of material was, was copied. Um, and then 2.3% here, uh, improper subject matter for the DMCA. In this set, that was largely trademark issues rather than copyright issues which aren't covered by the DMCA. Um, very briefly, um, I'll go into some findings from study three, which was very interesting because it just raised a whole different um, set of issues that sort of shone the light on a different part of what's going on in notice and takedown. So we decided to pull out a subset of these notices and take a random sample of those. We ended up with Google image search notices. Um, right away, you can see the scale is much different. So for the, for the six months, there were 33,000 requests, roughly. The web search was about 107, 108, like almost that whole rest of it was Google web search. So it's already at a much smaller scale. And surprisingly, um, one individual person, she's a, a European model, sent single-handedly, 53% of the takedown requests, um, none of which were valid. They were actually um, defamation and harassment complaints. Um, so th that was, those are some interesting overall things that happened uh, that, we, that we, we saw. Um, this, if you remember back from the Google web search, this is almost a complete flip. In the Google image search world, they're almost all sent by the principals themselves. They aren't using the agents in this, in this category. And of those principals, almost all of them are individuals. So the copyright, it's, not, it's not only the copyright holder, but it is an individual rather than a record label or a, a movie studio. Um, and then this, in contrast to the torrent uh, sites and the file search sites, um, here's where we might be um, more concerned about expression, arguably. These are largely targeting social media sites, personal websites and blogs, um, individual posts, that sort of thing. Um, again, a lot of questions of accuracy. If you include Ella Miller's requests, about 70% of them had potential flaws. Um, since she has very particular issues, we actually separated, separated her out. But even so, 37% of the remaining um, notices to Google image search had some flaws. Here, the largest group is 15.1% uh, improper subject matter for the DMCA. Um, I think uh, 
um, this, this does sort of make sense. It's an image search site, and individuals are using it to take down content largely with privacy concerns. Um, and uh, another 11.6% here have potential fair use defenses. Um, here it's more about, under US law, like curated collections and adding to material. So potentially, this is not, you know, none of this is definite. There would have to be a much deeper legal analysis here, but just flagged with characteristics that one might think um, are in favor of fair use. And 6% had ownership issues uh, and a handful of other issues. Um, I just have one slide left. I'll just give you, this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that we were seeing. Um, this first one is a trademark issue um, and also had additional information in the notice about um, they, they changed their branding. They didn't want these old images of Wally Gator Park um, up online. Um, and so they're taking down what appear to be like vacation photos of the park and the, the imagery there. Um, the second one is a, a very, another very common um, issue that comes up in these image search notices. So this is says private pictures um, meant for ex-girlfriend and she's using them to blackmail me. So very sympathetic claims, as is the third one. Uh, my passport's been published, I want it taken down. Um, all right, I think I've used my time, but I look forward to your questions later, and thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to specifically uh, talk about some of the work that we've done that's created a little bit of evidence around, uh, around website blocking, because I think that's probably the most pertinent thing around how, how intermediaries are working in the UK that, 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 that the Open Rights Group has done. But I think it is worth just sort of making some general observations first. Um, obviously, intermediaries have a lot of power uh, at this point to influence the way that we communicate, uh, to, to define the boundaries of what is uh, acceptable what, uh, in terms of taste and decency as well as uh, copyright. I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with the sort of examples around Facebook takedowns. Um, I think there are real concerns around um, political speech as well, uh, you know, given the sort of pressure to censor uh, terrorist or extremist content, um, and ultimately the bluntness with which uh, all of these intermediaries deal with these materials. Um, in practice, most of it is a combination of automatic um, matching, user complaints, and semi-trained reviewers uh, doing the, the making the judgments and of course that doesn't tend to be very satisfactory and at the same time we have great political pressure from governments to in, for, for intermediaries to intervene and do the job that the government doesn't want to do um, I could give you some good reasons why that takes place the first is that it's cheaper for government to get intermediaries to act the second is that uh, you can bash intermediaries over the head for some alleged social ill um, and score points uh, through doing that uh, and then at the end of the process say well look we've succeeded because these intermediaries have done these things even if those things are entirely ineffective you can claim victory and I think we've seen several cases of this in the UK um, unfortunately around child protection child abuse images um, some of it strikes me as essentially a shakedown operation for instance on Google when Google was asked to censor to, uh, search terms because they potentially could reveal uh, child abuse images uh, and to introduce sort of um, messages to people. So if you searched, for instance, for David Cameron child abuse images, you'd get a warning that you were, uh, you do get a warning saying that you are potentially viewing illegal content uh, and would you like help? Now, if you search David Cameron pig. <laughs> well, indeed, you know, so. Um, I mean, the question there is, you know, obviously people then start to feel monitored, uh, whether anyone is really searching for child abuse images, David Cameron, I doubt. Uh, and that then asks you, makes you, it makes you ask uh, if that, you know, if, if, if these terms appear to be in some way redacted, searched, uh, you know, restricted, uh, you get warnings or whatever for such broad terms, well, what exactly do they really think they're achieving? And why are they blackmailing companies into doing things which are clearly not going to be effective? It, it's, it's very, very strange. Um, and of course, 
Google donated a very large sum to the uh, Internet Watch Foundation through that process. Now, you know, was that a good thing? Was that reasonable? Uh, is that really the way that public policy should be conducted? I'll come back to the IWF in a little bit. Um, the thing I want to focus on, though, is, is what Org has done in this space and monitor a very specific problem that's relate, sort of come out of this dialogue between uh, the government wanting industry to do things but not wanting it to you know it the government to take direct responsibility we can avoid it and that is um child protection in the in the form of uh parental filtering on phones and internet and we've been concerned about this because it's been pushed out in a very broad manner so now lots of people ha you know you all have it on your phones you all have these censorship regimes on your phone unless you switch it off and of course, for a lot of people, that feels like I'm ringing up my phone company to tell them I want pornography. You know, even when it's when perhaps it's just like your local tobacconist has got blocked, something like that. And that that people people don't like doing this. Um, people are not being warned about it. Uh, uh, the the censorship is just taking place. And of course, people say it's not censorship because you can switch it off. Um, now. I just say to, to people, well, you know, you you might be able to act, but the websites are finding it really, really difficult. You know, if you, a website, are finding your site blocked and you're not a customer of these ISPs, it's in fact very difficult to get the problem corrected. And usually the companies will say, well, would you like to switch your blocking off? You know, that's what they will say to people when their, their, their sites are incorrectly listed. If you ring customer support, you'll get those sorts of reaction. Now, the ISPs have tidied up their act somewhat. The, uh, I, I have to say the mobile companies have reduced the amount of uh, blocking that they're doing to, to a relatively narrow set of things that are mostly to do with adult material, and that's good. Um, uh, th but the fixed line ISP, broadband ISPs, have gone much, much further, and two of them, TalkTalk Talk and Sky, just switched on this filtering for their customer base if they hadn't... Um, responded to various requests to set the filters themselves or not. And that's resulted in a spike in take-up, if you look at Ofcom's reports. Um, but this take-up is just people who haven't actually chosen it. It's just people who've, for whom this has been switched on by default. And again, that poses a lot of problems for website owners. So because you, you don't know whether your customers can reach you or not. And in the case of the fixed line broadband uh, providers, they're blocking a great deal more content than just pornography. It's a much broader range of things that might be concerning to children. So what the Open Rights Group has done very specifically is build a web service called blocked.org.uk, which allows you to find out whether your website is being blocked on any of these services. You can find out. You just put in the URL. We test on a bunch of lines whether this is happening and give you a report back in real time. Really, really simple, and that's helping us to build up a sort of evidence base of people being blocked. And just to give you an idea of the sort of problem areas we're encountering, it's things like LGBT sites that have keywords that get them mixed up with pornography. It's a whole load of charity sites that talk about harmful activities, abuse. Maybe they're t trying to give people advice about, uh, you know, what happens if you're uh, partner is abusing you because the keywords look like the same sorts of keywords as sites promoting abuse and violence and this is a problem because it's all keyword based uh, things which are trying to help look very similar to things that are trying to harm um, now I'm not saying you know I'm just saying it, it's a difficult area and uh, the, the filters are very automated there's not always a lot of human review they're bought uh, in bulk from America so the ISPs aren't taking much responsibility for the actual blocks um, and the ability to correct it is you know is it, really difficult the only way you can find out if you're not a customer is to use our web service that's the only way you know mo there's only I think one provider O2 that provides any sensible mean of means of discovering uh, whether you're being blocked or not so the thing I would like to kind of ask you as researchers is, if this interests you as a problem, we have a massive data set that we keep building. Uh, we need an analysis of this. Uh, if you're interested in helping, please get in touch. Um, we have API access and so on. The data is released as open data. In any case, we're really interested in hearing what people might want 
uh, us to do in order to improve the product and make it more useful uh, for people who would like to do research. So if that interests you, please tell us. And we'd be really, really interested in doing some collaboration. Um, so a couple of things on this, uh, how this goes uh, post the vote yesterday, maybe or no, maybe not. Um, a bit, and, a, and a bit about how this has got to be, yeah, it's got to be reserved, got to be dealt with legally. Um, the net neutrality uh, regulations that are coming into force through Europe say you can't just block stuff. You have to ask first, or you have to have a legal regime that supports this. Um, you. It seems to us that the government can't just say, well, we'll have a legal re regime to allow people to have default blocking. Because, uh, I mean, how on earth would that be reasonable to just randomly block websites until someone switches it off? That, that just, you know, without any review. I mean, that's just kind of legalizing arbitrary behavior. So we don't think that's practical. It feels very much like they've got to tighten up this question around prior consent. If that happens, great. Of course, this is going to be a very touchy area. The same goes for the Internet Watch Foundation. It seems very, very difficult to justify ISPs doing blocking without any legal structure in the net neutrality directive. And of course, the government, if it doesn't sort that out, is running the risk of someone coming along, judicially reviewing what the IWF are doing, pulling the whole thing down as a pack of cards, and then the blocking not taking place, um, and that actually being the government's fault for failing to legislate. So there's a really precarious situation going on there. The government is running the risk of causing a huge public stink around material that none of us approve of because of its own failure to act. And I don't suppose it's got its eye on, on, on these sorts of balls very much at the moment. Um, let's see if they do start thinking about it over the next few weeks. I kind of th that, that probably does me. Thank you. Um, if you look in, inside the brochure, the blackest pages are yes. our project. <laughs> so I'm also black, so the color I happen to like a lot as well. Um, also, if you look at the program, it says, um, how do online intermediaries control the way we speak, create, and live online? And I will just uh, add an Oxford comma and die. Um, so uh, the project is re was um, really about how um, more broadly, it didn't really just include intermediaries and how they control the way uh, we die or the way uh, what happens to our data, our, our creative works, uh, everything that we leave, our identities online. Uh, it was a bit more than that. So um, we, we realized the first question we had to answer in this, uh, for, for this project is what is this content uh, and what are we looking at? So we looked at uh, games, virtual worlds, uh, we looked at social networks and emails and try to see first um, is this content really legally clear whether it's property whether it's um, something that is licensed is intellectual property is it just personal data so that was the first dif most difficult question <laughs> that we did have to answer and there's no clear cut answer as you can imagine obviously it's the law so um, there is a lot of uh, potentially copyrighted or copyrighted content on, obviously, on all of these platforms, especially social media, um, we would say. The problem with copyright there uh, that we found was, uh, first, whether this content is considered published or unpublished. And if some of that is unpublished because it hasn't been, uh, your privacy settings are strict or you, you, know, you haven't really published it in, in that case, it's just been uh, communicated to, to a narrow group of people, uh, then what happens to that content is more, a bit more interesting than what happens to the content that, is, uh, that has been published, which is, again, obviously um, copyrighted. So for the unpublished content, there is a problem in the, uh, compute, uh, in the computer, uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act, um, where, where uh, one of the provisions states that there should be entitlement to the physical medium of this uh, unpublished content. And the problem here is that there is no physical medium where we, have to, we can have an entitlement to. So that, that's the problem with the transmission of, of the unpublished, um, unpublished content. That's one of the suggestions that this, perhaps this provision should be um, considered and perhaps revised and changed. 
Um, for, the, for the published content, the problem is, uh, again, controlled by the intermediaries. So uh, as most of you are well aware of, uh, the um, terms of service and, uh, and contracts online are restrictive. Uh, the uh, pr service providers take a broad license, and even though they claim that you retain, well, the ones we analyzed, Google and Facebook in particular, you retain ownership um, of your content, you don't really, if you look at the concepts of ownership and the control you have to have in order to, to have proper property and ownership, because you cannot uh, then pass, you cannot pass it on, um, on death, which is one of the, one of the elements of, of property and ownership. So, so there's that. There's that problem with, with the terms um, of service and contracts and the control, obviously, of, of the big service providers where we do store a lot of our, as we know, personal data and, and the content that is potentially copyrighted. Um, after that, we looked at some um, tech solutions that, meanwhile, during our project emerged, which was really nice and which we supported and uh, tried to make make some sense of and spoke, spoke to service providers about that as well, trying to help them um, improve them at the moment. Uh, it's interesting that one of them, for example, um, Google, and I'll show it to you. Um, so first, how many of you have heard of the Google Inactive Account Manager? Well, good. Good. It's always like that. Um, so if you go somewhere in your account settings on Google, on Gmail, or whatever, it's really difficult. So I, have it, um, I find it difficult to, to find this every time I search. So yeah, very user friendly. Um, you will find this service called Inactive Account Manager, where you can set up a timeout period up to 18 months. Um, and if you're not active on Google, so they will be looking at your search uh, data, at your sign-ins, everything they can find, they will suppose you are inactive or dead. So um, you can choose here to have your um, account deleted after that period of time, or you can designate some beneficiaries um, that will get some of your content, and then you can choose whether that's Gmail content, G+, um, other, other Google services uh, that are there. So basically, this is a tech solution to, to the problem uh, and allows you to transmit your uh, Google content, whether it's personal data, whether it is um, um, copyright, uh, copyrighted material, um, post-mortem. So that's one, one of the solutions, and it was quite welcoming with a lot of problems. Obviously, most of them uh, are to do with jurisdiction and different laws in succession, different laws on property and probate all, all over the world. So one, one size fits all solution is not perhaps the best one. Um, another one is Facebook Legacy Contact. How many of you have heard of this before? Okay, another popular service. Yeah. Death is really popular. Uh, well, just for us, the weirdos. So, uh, yeah, now um, two years, no, one and a half, two years. So Legacy Contact, again, if you go to your account settings to security, security for some reason, it doesn't really make sense, you will find a Legacy Contact similar quite similar to uh, Google Inactive Account Manager, where you can, um, you, uh, I opted for the account deletion, obviously, I'm a privacy uh, kind of um, paranoid fundamentalist. Um, or you can, again, choose some beneficiaries who will get some of your content uh, on Facebook, pictures, posts, or you, they can have uh, access to a version of your account on Facebook without the access to, to uh, messages on the messenger, for example. So again, another tech solution. Um, so as I said, we, we did welcome that, but we, we do have um, a lot of critique and a lot of suggestions that uh, we're gonna engage perhaps with, with, with these um, service providers, and we did. So I think engagement in this project has been quite, quite uh, good over, over the course of, of the four years in the project. So we did engage with Google, with Twitter, for example. We didn't engage with Facebook. It was almost impossible. We tried our best. Um, and uh, we engaged with some policy makers as well. So for example, advice pro bono, Wisconsin uh, lawmakers on their um, bill for digital assets and death. Uh, we also um, engaged with, with civil society in the last IGF in Brazil. Uh, there was a panel on death and digital, uh, digital assets where ISOC was there, uh, Google was there, and some other civil society um, groups from, 
from America who were lobbying for uh, post-mortem kind of privacy stuff. So just, just to conclude, um, the, I think one of the biggest outputs of this, of this project is the post-mortem privacy thing that we are now experts <laughs> on, and we get invited to talk on post-mortem privacy a lot. It's still an emerging legal kind of concept that we have to develop and evidence better, but uh, it goes in line with these technological developments and as well with some developments in the U.S. in the form of the mo model law for, for um, the Uniform State Commission, um, Uniform Law Commission created in the U.S. It's called the Uniform Access to Fiduciary Access uh, Act, and it has to be implemented in, on the state level because of the jurisdiction issues. But uh, that particular act recognizes these technological services explicitly and says that they override even your will and interstate succession. So it's very, very um, pro-postmortem privacy uh, approach, which is perhaps very different than uh, general privacy approach in America. We know uh, how different it is. So that's an interesting development, I think, an interesting social and technological and as well as legal development uh, in the US that, yeah, we might want to discuss. Okay. So that, that will be it. Thank you. So I think one of the problems of Google search is that uh, it doesn't uh, include, um, it only searches for, for single words and the, and the um, sort of connotation how the words are, are combined, the sentence, is not something that Google is actually analyzing. This is part of why uh, all these mistakes actually are actually happening and probably uh, artificial intelligence is, is, is something that we might have to, ta to talk about uh, next time we meet, uh, because this is probably a tool that is going to solve a lot of that stuff. There's a good article, older article by Boris Groys, uh, who, which was published in 2007 about this, uh, the specifics of, of Google search and the, and the implications that this sort of failed or not, not complete uh, way of understanding uh, the search terms, um, what that means for us, just as an additional. Um, does, does anyone on the panel want to respond to that quickly? Or do we just go to the next question? Is that more a comment than a question? I'd actually say myself that I think this does bring in the issues of machine learning and algorithmic transparency as a really basic research task for like the next phase of CREATE. I have less faith than you in the ability of international in, of artificial intelligence to make this better rather than worse. But that's just me. Um, so we've got a gentleman here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who spend an awful lot of time looking at this, um, I'm interested in your sense of how we know whether it's working or not, or like where the threshold for things like takedown is, is going well and when it's going poorly, especially in light of technological changes that will alter how all of this stuff happens. So when we look back and you know, a lot of these projects look at you know, previous instances of takedowns, how should we think about whether those are evidence of good takedown behavior, bad takedown behavior, right? How do we think about the system costs and the error costs, especially in light of technologies that two years from now will look different from the ones that we have currently? Um, it's a good question. I think, um, I think there's a lot of evidence that notice and takedown is working well in the States. It's um, an efficient mechanism for getting infringing material removed online. Um, and even at scale, I think it's doing quite well. Um, rights holders are pushing for more automated systems and more proactive measures. Um, and I think, based on our research, when those sorts of measures are needed, they're being voluntarily implemented by the online service providers. Um, there's definitely room for improvement, and I think our research also surfaced some of that. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't get into it, but there's definitely good and bad practices for notice sending. Um, and we have definitely spoken with rights enforcement organizations that have better practices that are not measuring their worth based on the number of notices that they're sending, but on the accuracy of those notices. Um, so I think that you know we can we can. We can do better to improve the the um, search algorithms that are that are 
um, detecting this infringing content and do more human cross-checks on the results of those um, searches. And for the other side, for the human senders, we just, we, we need a lot more education out there about what is the proper use of the system. But overall, I think that there's, the system is adapting well to the scale because of some of the voluntary measures that are, that are being implemented when needed. Make a yeah. brief. Let's give one example where I think this has gone a little bit haywire in the UK, which is with the copyright uh, blocking that's taking place by, uh, by uh, court order. The court orders in the UK allow the uh, rights holders to vary the domains that are blocked. Um, but what happens is that when, when they block uh, particularly popular websites, they start uh, duplicating themselves and you get more and more uh, copies of these sites all over the place. And so you, you know, get literally done dozens and hundreds of Pirate Bay copies and uh, you know, uh, proxies and so on, which means that the takedown notice people have to do takedown notices for every single instance. So they spend, a, you get a sort of cat and mouse game as a result of this. Um, and a huge, huge proliferation in the amount of work that the takedown companies have to do in order to keep the content relatively suppressed. Now, I'm not saying uh, that rights holders have no right to do that. I'm just saying it doesn't seem particularly, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be a particularly good outcome. Right, I'm afraid we've gone over our time. I know there'll be more questions. I'm sure the speakers would be very happy to talk to you individually, but we're on a tight schedule here. So can we just have a final round of applause for all our speakers, please? Thank you. Thank you.